on this episode of China Unscripted. China is trying to suck resources from the Pacific Islands. They're offering investment and corrupting politicians. But one island is resisting. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm not Chris Chapel. I'm Matt Ganesta. I'm Shelley Chan. Chris is. I'm uh, also not Chris Chapel. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sitting in Chris's that's seat. That's true. And I'm wearing true. a tie this time. You know. Oh, that's true. I forgot you don't usually wear a tie on the show. No, I usually let Chris wear the tie, but today I'm wearing the tie. I have all the power. Of course, Chris. Chris will be back next time. He's just he's not feeling like today. Well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, at any rate, joining us today, we have a guest, John Coons. He is a private equity investor and investment banker. He's chairman and CEO of Numa Numa Resources in Bougainville, which is an island in the Pacific. Uh, he's also the author of the book, They Call Me Ishmael, a novel based on the real story of a rebel leader with big dreams for his island. John, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. So, you know, today we want to talk about Bougainville. It's an island that could soon become the world's newest country. Uh, so tell us a bit about Bougainville and its fight for independence. Well, Bougainville uh, got into a fight for independence as a result of the Panguna mine, which when it operated in Bougainville, uh, owned by Rio Tinto at the time, was the largest copper and gold mine in the world. And it operated from 1972 to 1989. Unfortunately, in the distribution of the profits from the mine, Bougainville was left out. Uh, the shareholders received about a third of the profits. Papua New Guinea received close to 62%. And Bougainville got a, 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 a piddling amount of 4 to 5%, which precipitated a civil war between Bougainville and Papua New Guinea called the crisis, in which about 10% of Bougainville's population of 200,000 people at the time perished, not necessarily by bullets, but there was also an embargo of Bougainville enforced by Papua New Guinea, the mother country. So there was no food and no medical supplies or provisions in Bougainville. It was a brutal civil war. And that's essentially what what the Civil War was about, and it was uh, brought to an end by the Bougainville Peace Agreement in 2001. So uh, Bougainville is currently part of Papua New Guinea, right? Uh, but Correct. it's uh, last uh, November, they had a vote, which was a non-binding referendum, where about 98% of people voted for independence. And that doesn't mean they're going to be independent, right? So so what what does this mean and, and, and why do they want to be independent? Right. The Bougainville Peace Agreement, which again ended the crisis in 2001, gave Bougainville uh, special autonomous uh, controls of its, of its islands. It's, it's actually an archipelago group. Uh, including its own constitution, its own president, its own legislature, and certain uh, court uh, court and legal rights. Uh, they did not, however, retain the rights to defense, uh, in other words, armed policemen or uh, foreign exchange and, and, and currency. But the Bougainville Peace Agreement also gave Bougainville, within 20 years, the right to conduct a UN supervised independence referendum, which took place actually in December of 2019. And that referendum was essentially uh, structured as a, as a single question. Would you like to continue to be part of Papua New Guinea or would you prefer to be independent? 98% of those registered to vote, which was uh, about 207,000 of Bougainville's 300,000 people uh, indicated that they wanted to be independent. And yes, you are correct. That independence referendum is not, a, not quote unquote binding. In other words, it doesn't obligate Papua New Guinea to just let them go. There has to be a negotiation. And that has been taking place since December of 2019. But ultimately, Bougainville will become the newest nation on earth. They have no desire to remain part of Papua New Guinea. 
And Papua New Guinea doesn't have a desire to try to keep Bougainville? Oh, yeah, no, they do. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I'll tell you what that, that, that comes from. It's all, it's all related to the copper and the gold. But back when the crisis erupted, why did it take place? Well, the, P- the Panguna mine, excuse me, was 45% of Papua New Guinea, which was then a fledgling country. It just went independent in 1975 as a former territory of Australia. The Panguna mine was 45% of their GDP, about 18% of their foreign exchange and so forth. So you can imagine when that mine shut down, they had to try and reopen it. However, today there's uh, 20 similar copper and gold mines in Papua New Guinea, none as large as, uh, well, one or two as large as as the Panguna mine, but they still don't want Bougainville to leave. Why? Because Papua New Guinea is a a generally unstable place. It's a pretty fractious environment. There are 800 different dialects and languages spoken there, and it's really an amalgamation of New Britain, New Ireland, the mainland island, New Guinea, and so forth. And they they don't want the stability that might be caused by Bougainville leaving. So are they afraid that if Bougainville leaves, then other places will want to leave, like it'll destabilize? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying actually two things. Yes, uh, Papua New Guinea itself is concerned that if Bougainville leaves, maybe New Britain will leave, which is another island, okay? The other real concern, though, I think the the overarching concern in the region is not necessarily one simply held by Papua New Guinea. Uh, Australia and many other nations in the South Pacific area are worried about China coming into a destabilized vacuum-like area and, and, and are trying to, to, to contain that, that problem. Uh, now, I, I do want to talk mainly about China, but before we do, I just, a lot of people are wondering, because Bougainville, it sounds like it's kind of a, a funny name, right? Like, like how, did, how did it get that name? Right. That is a funny name. Okay. Uh, two, two men discovered Bougainville exactly 200 years apart. Uh, uh, the first was a Spanish explorer, uh, Al- Alvaro Mendena, and he uh, discovered the island in 1568. He's also the man who discovered uh, the, the, the Solomon Islands, and he named them the Solomon Islands because he was convinced that they held uh, untold treasures. He neglected to map Bougainville as part of his discovery. The rumor is, or the, the supposition is, he wanted to keep it for himself. But he then died of tropical disease uh, five years later. So Bougainville was left undiscovered and uncharted until another explorer, Count Louis de Bougainville of France, bumped into the island, which shouldn't have been there because there was just an expansive ocean in most of the charts. 200 years later in 1768. So he, of course, named it for himself, and both men thought they discovered the island when, in fact, it had been inhabited for 30,000 years already. So, okay, so that makes sense, because it, it does, Bougainville does sound like a place that Australia would sound, would send its rednecks. <laughs> yeah, well. I was wondering if you actually get that joke. Maybe like five of our viewers will actually understand that reference. <laughs> Uh, listen, I, I get the joke, and and, and Bougainvillians w- would too. Uh, Australia may not have sent just rednecks, but they sent thousands of miners over to build and then operate the Panguna mine. And so there was certainly uh, friction between the Bougainvillians and these visitors. But the biggest uh, concern was the Papua New Guineans, who were also brought over to work in the mine. Those people in Bougainville are called redskins. Uh, Why? Because Bougainvillians are the darkest people you've ever seen. They they are really, really black. 
And by contrast, people from Papua New Guinea who have a more chocolatey complexion seem lighter. So, so in Bougainville, it's not exactly a negative term, but they're called redskins. So, so the conflict was really uh, basically between those two peoples over, again, over the mine. What is kind of the population of Bougainville like now? Is it, you know, the vast majority of people are Bougainvillians or are is there, you know, immigration from other parts of Papua New Guinea or are there still is there still an Australian presence? Uh, B- Bougainville, again, is an archipelago. There are 300,000 people living there. There's two large islands. Bougainville Island has about 250,000 people. Buka Island has about 40,000. There are 10,000 on the atolls. And yes, they are largely Bougainvillean. There are, Bougainville is part of Melanesia and they view themselves as Melanesians. So they're happy to interact with other Melanesians and they view them as cultural brothers, if you will. Uh, in terms of Australians, Look, I'm, I, I live in the second largest town in Bougainville, which is called Arawa, and I'm one of three white people there. So, so basically, everybody who looks like me uh, left after the crisis ensued, and they have yet to come back. Okay, so, so you've lived uh, in uh, Bougainville for the last uh, five or six years now. Actually, I'm going on my eighth year. I've oh, averaged year. Okay. about eight, eight and a half to nine months a year in Bougainville over since since August of 2015. Okay, and and so uh, I want to talk a bit about China now. And so, what is uh, what is China's interest in Bougainville, and what have you observed? Okay, well, well, we'll get to this at some point, but I should just say uh, I, I know China very well. I, I've been involved with China since 1984. More on that if, if you're interested. But in terms of answering your question, China covets two things about Bougainville. First of all, obviously, the copper and gold resources in the Panguna mine. Just so you understand, The Panguna mine is the only mine that was explored, drilled, and then uh, operated in Bougainville. But the the estimate of uh, pretty much all geologists is there's another two or three Panguna mines in Bougainville Island, okay? The Panguna mine, even though it was mined for 17 years from 72 to 89, still has about 70% of its resources available. And those resources are today worth, ready, $100 billion. I didn't say million. I said $100 billion. About 70% of that is copper and the rest is gold. So Bougainville is a glittering jewel to anyone, especially the Chinese, who want to take it. And China sees two things in Bougainville, not just the natural resources, but Bougainville has not one, but two superb deep water ports. Forget the Solomon Islands right across the sea. Bougainville has the best deep water ports in the Solomon Islands. Bougainville is the largest of the Solomon Islands, even though it's not part of the political entity, the Solomon Islands. And the China, China wants the copper and gold, and they also want the ports. And they probably also want some of the uh, fisheries or the fishing uh, areas, right? The fishery resource, that's a good point, Matt. The fishery resource is second only to the gold and copper. It's major. Uh, in the Pacific, there are three or four basic kinds of tuna. One of them is skipjack. 25% of the Pacific skipjack are in PNG waters. And of that 25%, 30% are in Bougainville waters. That is the billions of annual fishing revenues and so forth. So yeah, the fishing is major in, in Bougainville waters. So, you know, uh, obviously like, you know, we, we've seen this pattern, right? Where the, the Chinese communist party, they do these, you know, they do these deals with other countries and they send in, um, well, let's just talk about fisheries for a minute. They send in their, the Chinese commercial 
fishermen, uh, displacing local fishermen who are then out of work, but then also because of the way the the Chinese uh, fishing boats do their fishing, they often basically just rape the waters and take take the fish out, destroy the environment, uh, leaving you know in a few years vastly dwindled uh, fish. Right. So this is right. You're, you're already talking about potentially a, a a major problem if China has a a, a deal with Bougainville. Um, and then, of course, you know, with the mining, um, you know, that's a whole other story. What what moves has China made to uh, entrench itself into Bougainville? Okay, well, it's important to point out that since Bougainville attained its autonomous region status in 2001, it had its first election under its new constitution in 2005, and there have been essentially four administrations since then. Uh, the first man, Joseph Kabui, died in office. He was the first man in elected president in Bougainville in 2005. He died after three years. There was a caretaker government until John Momus uh, became president in 2005. The Bougainville Constitution enables one to run for two five-year terms, but no more. Mr. Momus uh, was president for 10 years until uh, his terms were up. And then uh, Ishmael Tororama became the president in, in 2020. John Momus is not a Bougainvillian. He is an ex-priest, which goes a long way when you're running for office in Bougainville, because Bougainville is full of devout Christians, 80% of them Catholic and the other 20% of them evangelical. And Mr. Momus is half PNG and half Chinese. Mr. Momus was the ambassador from PNG to China for five years before he became president. So his first move in office was to sign six MOUs with six different SOEs in China. As you, as you folks, I'm sure know, uh, sometimes those papers aren't even worth the paper they're, they're written on. Nothing happened. But the Chinese have been trying to get a hold of the Panguna mine ever since. China supported three men, not one, but three men for president in the presidential election that just concluded with Ishmael Tuarama's victory in, 2000, in September 2020. So China has done everything it can think of to get a, a control of Bougainville. The, the major difference, and you're, you're right, your strategy about all the other Pacific islands, I think, is, is accurate. The major difference in Bougainville is one man, Ishmael Tororama, who wants nothing to do with the Chinese. Ishmael is a highly intelligent, absolutely incorruptible guy who wants to pattern his new nation like like ours, like the United States. And basically, that's the thing that can preserve Bougainville's independence as a democratic country, is that Ishmael is smart enough to realize that China's money, uh, it doesn't mean everything. It's interesting that you said that China supported three different candidates in the presidential election. The person who got elected was somebody who didn't want anything to do with them. I mean, was that part of his campaign of like a, a standing up to the CCP? Absolutely. Uh, the, the, going back to the Bougainville uh, crisis, the Civil War, the military, the guerrilla military organization that fought the crisis was called the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. Ishmael Tororama joined the BRA as a 20-year-old, but rapidly became the clear leader of that guerrilla group. There was a politician who uh, was named the commander of the BRA. His name is Sam Kauna, but Sam really wasn't up in the bush wielding a weapon against the PNG Defense Force. He was trying to be a politician. Sam Kauna is one of the men who came out and told everybody he was not only being backed by the Chinese, but he thought the Chinese were going to solve all of Bougainville's problems. 
He was on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation 60 Minutes in the fall of 2018 with all kinds of storyboards showing new ports, a uh, renovated uh, Panguna mine, uh, new roads, airports, and so forth, all to be provided via the Belt and Road program from his friends in China. So, so they, they backed him. They backed the former president, John Momus, who wanted to change the Constitution so he could run again. And they backed the third man just for good measure. Just to give you an idea, they spent millions of dollars unsuccessfully. Why? Because, yes, Ishmael said, uh, if we're going to be independent, we're going to be independent as Bogan Billions, not as a colony of China. Wow. So, yeah, the Bougainvilleans really dodged a bullet there with with Ishmael, I think. Absolutely. It's it's you know, when you talked about what happened with the previous administration in Bougainville, Momus, Momus, like how you said that they had signed some MOUs. Did Bougainvilleans start seeing any um, kind of. Uh, development from China. I'm just wondering, was there was there negativity towards China already by the time of the 2020 election? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Let me go back to something that's fundamental to Bougainville, and and it really isn't fundamental to a lot of these other Pacific Island nations. When Bougainville won its right to uh, quasi independence as as an autonomous region of Papua New Guinea. They, they got their own constitution and their own presidency. But in the constitution, what is fundamental in Bougainville is that the people control the resources under and above their land. So uh, the government has nothing to do with the resources below your land. There's only one other country in the world where that is also the case. It's right here in the good old U.S. of A., and they they structured the Constitution so that it would give the people the rights to those resources, because after all, that's why they were fighting the war, okay? Australia came in and took all the resources and said, these don't belong to you, and gave them all to other people. So the landowners are key to any deal you want to make. Now, that's not... China style, okay? What China wants to do is they want to go to, you've seen it a hundred times, we all have. They want to find the right politician to Greece, pay that person off, get control of the resources that way, and then not make any deal with the local landowners, okay? Well, it doesn't work in Bougainville. So every time they try and do it, the Bougainvillians realize, hey, there's some graft-ridden government guy trying to give away my rights, I'm not going to do it. So guess what happened? The big Chinese SOE, encouraged by Mr. Momus, took out the first 10 alluvial mining licenses. That's that's when you're mining gold out of a stream. It's not building a big uh, open pit or a hard rock mine. Took, it, took They took out the first 10 alluvial gold licenses in the Java River, which is right below the Panguna Mine, which is where a lot of gold is. They never made a deal with the landowners. They made a deal with Mr. Momus and his administration. They came in there, they built a 50-man man camp and started mining. And a year later, what happened? The landowners rose up and burned the place to the ground. And, and that's what happens in Bougainville when you don't make a deal with the landowners. And they don't care if you're Chinese or Martian. If you want to make a deal with the landowners, they'll talk to you because they can't harness the resources themselves. But the Chinese, of course, don't pursue those methods. So, I mean, your company, Numa Numa Resources, is involved in mining. And what you want to do is is restart that Panguna mine, right? Well, yes and no. Uh, here's, Matt, what I can tell you. If... if if you're a foreigner, what you learn pretty quick in Bougainville is the last thing to bring up as a foreigner is the Panguna mine. The minute you do, you're identified as just another carpetbagger. So if you think the Panguna mine is a valuable thing and, and who doesn't, what you have to do is say, okay, well, how, how can I get these people 
to trust me and respect me so that when they need someone to help them redevelop the Panguna mine because they don't have the money and they don't have the technology, they think of me. And that's basically what our strategy was when we went there in 2015. And the reason it's taken so long is, is because it takes a long time to do what I just said. But that that is our strategy. And if they want us to help them redevelop the Panguna mine, which they have said to me they do, we stand ready to help them. Okay. So you're doing things like building roads and bringing trade, right? Correct. That is correct. We're doing basically, Matt, our approach, it's, it's not necessarily what they teach you at Harvard Business School, but our approach is not what we want to do. What do you want to do? You, you are the people of Bougainville. What do you need? How can we help you? We're not an NGO. We're, we're in business to make a profit, hopefully a big one. But basically, our strategy has been to do things that they need. And in that process, to become their most trusted partner, which I think today we are. That is a somewhat different approach than uh, Chinese companies tend to take, which is, oh, they come in and they say, what, what can we take from you? <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds nice on the surface, what they promise, right? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's that the timing of, of this um, podcast is interesting because this week, the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, is traveling around to seven different yeah. uh, Pacific Island nations, and he's trying to woo those plus a, a, a three others that he's... Um, trying to get to sign this, um, what is it called? The China Pacific Island Countries Common Development Vision, which yep. is written by the Chinese Communist Party uh, unilaterally for all these other nations to basically sign on to uh, as a multilateral agreement. What does that look like to you uh, in the context of uh, Bougainville and also the Pacific Island nations at large? Well, if it's obviously a, a huge con game, okay? And and the, the best thing I can tell you about Bougainville is they have two things that are a, a huge impediment to the Chinese strategy working in Bougainville. Number one, they have Ishmael Torarama, okay? Highly intelligent, absolutely incorruptible. The only thing he cares about is Bougainville and Bougainvillians and... The government doesn't control the resources. That's where most of the other Pacific Island nations get screwed because the government does control at least portions of the resources. So if you can find a susceptible government person or two, you've got a way in to the kingdom. And, and that's, that's what Bougainville has that should make it a beacon of hope in the South Pacific. If we could just convince... Australia and the United States of that and not to support somebody like PNG, which is an abysmal corporate uh, company run by corrupt government officials. So, you know, uh, the, the people of Bougainville do need some investment help, right? And they can look to China, they can look to the United States, they can look to Australia and New Zealand you know, out, outside of what you're, you as an American uh, individual are doing, uh, what is the U.S. government or the Australian or Kiwi governments doing? Yeah, well, that's, um, th that is a key question. And, and let me just say, yes, I'm an American and there, there's only one American that I know of on Bougainville and that's me. But uh, I have predecessors, namely the armed forces in World War II, who were the only uh, foreign people who came there, not, not the Spaniards, not the French, not the Germans, not the Australians, not the Chinese, not even the PNG people. The Americans came there, and when they were done with their job, they said, hey, folks, here's your islands back. Have a nice day, okay? Bougainvillians have never forgotten that. They, they love Americans because of that concept. So they, they want us to help them. Now, the problem is when you go, I've taken Bougainvillian chiefs to Washington, D.C. I've introduced them to senators, to congressmen, to uh, the, the head of USAID, the head of the Development Finance Corporation, all these other agencies. And here's what always happens. People say, 
gee, John, this sounds great. What's Australia have to say about this? So I've been down to Canberra too. And when you go down to Canberra, here's what they've said historically. John, John, listen, Ishmael wants independence. That, that's kind of roiling the waters. We, don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. Well, that's the same thing that people were saying in Europe before Ukraine and, and Russia got into this tussle that they're in. The boat's already rocking, folks. Okay, China's rocking the boat. And so, you know, there's got to be uh, an anchor to windward in that part of the world. Australia and the United States historically have thought that that anchor to windward was PNG. Now, I'm going to tell you, they're wrong. The anchor to windward is Ishmael Tororama and Bougainville. They're going to be, they're highly intelligent people. They're, they're very ethical and moral, and they can afford independence. They just need some help from the U.S. and Australia. And so so hopefully, especially because of what's happened right across the water in the Solomons, Australia and the United States are now going to lend more of a helping hand to Bougainville than they've been willing to do in the past. Is there any pressure politically to try to keep from Australia, from the U.S., or even um, from China on Papua New Guinea to try to keep Bougainville in Papua New Guinea? Yeah, uh, I, I would say uh, it's it's a strong undercurrent. Everybody is asking, well, Ishmael Torama, could, how, how about how about some kind of greater autonomy? And the president is saying he, he's he's a practical man. Uh, I I don't talk to him about these details, uh, but yes, there is definite pressure for Bougainville to stay. I, I just think, however, if anybody goes to a street corner in Bougainville and talks about that to the person on the street, they'll laugh you right off the corner. I mean, they, they don't want that. They don't want to be affiliated with anybody like PNG anymore because PNG has treated them very badly. So how do they actually go from a 98% vote of wanting independence to actually officially being independent? It's a great question. And basically, that's why I'm back in the U.S. now. I'm, I'm helping the president to essentially get the money to pay for independence. And, and Matt, it depends on redeveloping the Panguna mine and developing Bougainville's other economic development opportunities, which include, as you mentioned earlier, fishing. But it's not just that. Bougainville there's 300,000 people, only about 8,000 people have electricity. I'm developing an island-wide hydroelectric power driven electric utility just, just to provide electrification. You can't redevelop any economy without electricity. So it's gotta it's gotta be all that. And it's a mouthful, but it can it can happen because they have the resources to pay for that. So yeah, I never thought of independence as something you have to pay for like like they just you mean they just need money to be self-sustaining right or do they actually have to pay papua new guinea like here's you know 100 million dollars can we have our independence no no it's it, it's it's the former it, it, they've got to be so here's what's happening so so as i said the, the independence referendum was not binding it's 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 one thing, one event. Now there's a negotiation. The negotiations are actually called the JSBs, Joint Supervisory Boards, and they happen every quarter. And essentially, PNG's strategy has been, hey, Bougainville, my Melanesian brother, you can't afford independence. So look, you know, stop crying about this and let, let's figure out how we can stay friends and stay part of the same country. What the president is saying is, no, I can afford independence, and I'm going to not only show you, I'm going to show the world. Because when I show the world, the UN, the diplomatic community around the world, that I can afford independence, then nobody can deny my people who already voted 98% to become independent to, to go out as a free country. Uh, okay. And so how long do you expect this process to take? <laughs> That's, 
a lot of people ask me. <laughs> um, it's going to take a while, but the president uh, has somewhat symbolically uh, chosen to say, well, if it took PNG five years from 1970 to 1975 to attain independence from Australia, and their basis for doing so was the Panguna Mine, because it was, then we will use the Panguna Mine's redevelopment, and once again, we will achieve independence for Bougainville from PNG in the same five-year period, from when I was elected in September 2020 to September 16th, 2025, September 16th, 1975 being the date in Independence Day in PNG. Now, Matt, do I think it's really going to happen? Uh, do I do I think independence can happen by 2025? I'm not sure. Are they going to have all the money necessary? Definitely not. But they can make a start. You've got to remember, Bougainville used to be the most prosperous province in Papua New Guinea when the big mine was going full blast. It is now the least prosperous. Uh, there's no electrification. The government of PNG is supposed to send money to Bougainville. Uh, they find ways not to do that. So Bougainvillians are a hardy lot. Do they need to harness all of that $100 billion in order to become independent? No, they just need a little bit of it. So I think the, the nation can step-by-step step achieve this. It's it's going to take some time, though. You're right about that. Has China given up on Bougainville now, or are they still trying to find ways to get involved? Oh, you you know China better than that. They're very patient people. They're, they're not giving up at all. I mean, they're, they're just waiting. They realize Ishmael is, is no friend of Belt and Road and, and related uh, defense maneuvers that come afterwards. So, but they're saying, hey, you know, he's only got 10 years, right? So, so let's just let's just hunker down here in the weeds and watch what happens. But they covet that copper and that gold and those strategic uh, harbors and ports. So, no, they haven't given up. Uh, I think Bougainville's got to succeed in spite of them. So, you know, you've been. Uh working in China, you know, on and off since 1984, you said. And starting in 2005, you ran uh, the uh, China Hydroelectric Corporation, which is a foreign-owned company. And you ran that for about a decade, right? Correct. Yes. So uh, in that process of living and working in China and running a company there, what did you learn about how the Chinese Communist Party operates with respect to investment? Okay, well, well, first of all, just, just to be clear, uh, I've been doing business in China since long before 2005. Uh, in 1984, I was the first American to go to China and buy Chinese hydroelectric turbine gensets for my hydroelectric plants in the United States. And I've been doing business in China ever since then. Okay, I'm the first American to develop hydroelectric plants in a joint venture on the Min River in Fujian in the 1990s. And then, yes, we established China Hydroelectric Corporation in 2005. We took it public on the New York Stock Exchange. We were the largest foreign-owned power company in the People's Republic of China. And we developed, owned, and operated 27 hydroelectric stations aggregating over 500 megawatts around China. So to answer your question now, I, I met Xi Jinping, by the way, when he was governor of Fujian. Uh, we had a big loan with uh, Bank of China, Fujian branch. There was a big ceremony. And my princeling partner, uh, and, and as you, you folks undoubtedly know, princelings are anybody who's descended from the original founding fathers and so forth. Uh, my princeling partner was a guy named uh, Dr. Lin. Dr. Lin's grandfather, Lin Bo Chu, was uh, Chairman Mao's chief quartermaster and chief financial officer and the first minister of finance in China in uh, the PRC's opening up in 1949. And 
What I can tell you is uh, I view the, the Chinese Communist Party as a big mafia-like organization. Everybody's got their own deals. You know, somebody's got heroin, somebody's got prostitution, you know, in the mafia. And it's a little different in China, but it's, it's very similar. Um, the Chinese Communist Party uh, really believes uh, their headlines, which is, you know, they are the center of the earth. And uh, their, their civilization was the dominant civilization in 1800 in the world, 35% of the GDP, and they're going to do it again. And, and I wasn't told that by my friend, Dr. Lin, I was told that by Xi Jinping directly. So uh, they're led by a leader that, that believes as much in his vision of empire as I think Mr. Putin believes in his. And, um, that's that's what the world is dealing with when they're dealing with China. Wow. So, uh, you know, I, I I don't know how much like you can ever go back to China now, like having said critical things. But I was just to kind of get an idea of if you're willing to talk about it, what are some of the things that the Chinese Communist Party uh, tried to force you to do in order to have a business partnership there? Well, actually, uh, I should just be clear, uh, and it's and it's all in my book. Uh, uh, they call me Ishmael. Uh, I am not allowed to go back to the People's Republic of China. I, w I was arrested via an exit ban in the Beijing airport uh, back in 2012, and I was able to buy my way out of that and get get out of China after a couple of weeks, and then get back to try and clean up my affairs, but uh, I've, I've been banned from China uh, since since about 2014, and I doubt that I could ever go back and wouldn't want to try, <laughs> okay? Uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of dealing with the Chinese Communist Party, uh, they made it very clear that they wanted an end to China Hydroelectric Corporation. Why? Well, look at our message. Uh, we, we were, all of our power plants were uh, low head uh, hydroelectric projects that renewable energy was, was, was our theme. And here at the same time was China saying to the rest of the world, hey, listen, there's nothing we can do. We have to pollute the atmosphere with all these uh, emissions and so forth because there, there's no choice. That That's complete nonsense. And China is the hydro capital of the world. They could have our company could have kept doing what we were doing forever, but they wanted us to go away. They wanted they wanted you to stop producing hydroelectric power, or they just wanted to control the hydroelectric power. They wanted a company that was owned and operated by foreigners to get the hell out of China. So in the end, they caused our acquisition and they split up the company shortly thereafter. I'm I'm kind of curious. What did they tell you the exit ban was for? Uh, they 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 said that it what what they do when they stage these exit bans is they get a somebody to swear out some kind of complaint. In this case, uh, we had a, a local an, an asset in Tianjin where they said we didn't pay the employees correctly. So there was a lawsuit filed against us. It was. A complete sham, of course, and that's that's the the pretense under which I was arrested. Hmm. Yeah, e exit bans are such a weird concept because we don't have them in the U.S. Like, like we we don't prevent people from leaving our right. country, right? But China, you know, they have a they have a very different view. But maybe it's just because they love you so much they don't want you to leave. <laughs> I don't think that's what's happening. You, you know, you're sure, it's not like. <laughs> based out of love uh yeah. they they want to love you into being scared for your life and then yeah. you'll run away faster right exactly uh, yeah. uh you know having been through that experience in china um you know a decade ago i think a lot of people there's this conception that you know it's xi jinping and i know you talked about meeting him and that he does have this idea of, you know, the China dream, the China empire. But there's there's this idea that, you know, it was good to do business in China until Xi Jinping came in. Um, but now even 
there are still people who are arguing that it's good to do business in China. What would you say to that? I'd say they're fools and they're just fooling themselves. Look, look what you say is, is absolutely correct. Uh, I think I, I was part of it. There was a golden era, if you will, uh, when doing business in China was was extraordinary. And I would say it, it was the 1990s and the first decade of this century until Xi Jinping was, was elected. But also, to be honest, the Chinese were making great strides. And, you know, I used to think to myself, you know, they're, they're just... They're just people like us. I mean, they're, they're, they're pursuing the same things we are pursuing. So how can I be critical of them? And I had great friends, and I still do, uh, Chinese people. But, you know, Xi Jinping, in a way, uh, what he's done has, has, has really kind of exposed China for, for what it is. And, uh, and China is not China. It's, it's the CCP and another 1.3 billion people, if you, if you ask me, okay? And uh, China now is not a place, I think, I, th I think any foreigner who's doing business there has to be saying, what is my exit strategy? <laughs> if it's not an exit ban, what is my exit strategy? Because long term, I, I just don't see how it can, 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 can continue, excuse me. I mean, but they're still, it's interesting because I think the COVID and a lot of the uh, Communist Party's reactions to COVID have, you know, messed up supply chains for people, have made people start to realize, okay, actually, it's better to have, you know, I can't just depend on China, right, for, for my company. But then I think this is probably one of the things that the Chinese Communist Party is most afraid of, that capital flight losing money, losing this economic engine. So you see in the propaganda now a lot of, you know, you know, the American Chamber of Commerce still says that China is a great place to do business. Like this is something China Daily is publishing, right? Like they're trying to simultaneously stay locked down and yet um, portray to the world that they're open for business. Anybody who thinks that China is still open for business is, is, is really kidding themselves. There are companies who unfortunately have to do business there, but I think in a way, you're right, this COVID process educated people that, hey, maybe we have to diversify our, our supply chains, diversify our production facilities and so forth. I think the strongest thing that the Chinese people have is the Chinese people, uh, the ones who are not members of the CCP. They're, they're lovely people, they're hardworking, and make no mistake about it, they're, they're businesslike. But that, that strength is, is not going to be able to carry them where Xi Jinping wants them to go. So uh, I, I think the, 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 good, the good days are over, and I think uh, the United States and all of our commercial and diplomatic partners should try and figure out how to diversify uh, ourselves away from China, how to control the commodities that are, are essential in the world so that China doesn't control them entirely themselves. It's going to take a, 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 a different mindset, but I think it's part of the future. Mm. Do you think that, because uh, you've mentioned that you've talked to U.S. senators and things on behalf of Bougainville, do you think that there's a, a growing awareness of that in the U.S. government? Yes, but it's it's a it's a grudging, slow moving. I wouldn't say glacial pace uh, change, but but it's look. I, I mean, I have to be honest. One thing that my Bougainville experience has, has taught me is that uh, governments are generally unaccountable. And uh, it's, it's really hard to talk sense to people in government until something else happens, like a war, okay? And I, I think, uh, you know, what's really been a strength of the United States 
so far, if they are allowed to continue to thrive, is, is our military, our military has been sounding the alarm about the Pacific for a while, South China Sea and so forth. And anybody who's a military historian knows that all this has happened before, right? It's called Japan in the 1920s and 1930s. And they were trying to do the very same thing. They were trying to control those Straits of Malacca and uh, the, the commerce up and up and around uh, Australasia. And they were trying to control the first, second, and third island chains, just, just like China is doing. It, it, so this has been done before. And uh, on the other hand, our government hasn't supported the military with the budget increases we need and that's that's going to be part of uh, a part of life going forward though i think i mean i think the days of us trying to cut our defense budgets are over for a while because china's going to keep this build up in the pacific going for the foreseeable future yeah and of course you know with the uh development vision they have for all these uh Pacific Island nations, I think they're hoping that with at least one or two of them, they can eventually get to a point where they can build military bases or naval bases there because they're going to need to get out of that first island chain in order to to be a power in the Pacific. Exactly. And I, look, that that is, that is what they're doing. I mean, uh, there's no question about it. Uh, I think the other thing, again, going all the way back to something you mentioned earlier, Fishing in the Pacific is a big deal, it's just like, you know, cobalt is in, in, in the Congo. And so the Chinese want to not only get military locations, but they want to get places where they control the, 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 the fishing. And that's like Kiribati and places like that. So that's, that's their strategy. And uh, we've just got to keep our eyes open because it's part of life going forward. It's funny you compare it to cobalt mining in the Congo because like that's a place where they're literally using like child slave labor to mine cobalt to bring it, you know, back to China for China's resources. Yeah. And like you can imagine that that same mentality where like that's totally cool with China if they're going to use child labor, you know, like how are they going to treat the fisheries in these countries that they make partnerships with? Right. Like it's just that same mentality where where any kind of abuses is like, oh, that's not really a problem as long as we can get our fish. Right. Well, you know, just so you know, before the Chinese government came and uh, well, the Chinese, the big Chinese SOEs, the fishing SOEs came and bribed the PNG officials to get those fishing licenses in PNG's waters. They had rogue fishing fleets who would come down to Bougainville, and you know how they fished? They threw sticks of, sticks of dynamite in the water. Oh my god! <laughs> that's, that's like that's, that's, that's like cartoonish. Yeah, but that that that's what they did until until the Bougainvillians ran them off. Wow. There's also the um, the boats that do the the trawling, right? Where they basically scrape up the bottom yeah. of the ocean and, but it also wrecks the coral and the, and the ecosystem there. It's, 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 it's a major offender. It, that's like piracy. They're, they're just like throwing sticks of dynamite into the water. Yeah. 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 Pirates, but not like the fun kind. Um, no. I mean, I hear they're coming for the gold too. So. <laughs> Yar, matey. <laughs> um, so, all right. So, <laughs> I feel like we're we're about to get off track. So, so uh, w w what have you seen in terms of Chinese investment in Papua New Guinea, uh, whether it's fishing or or setting up Chinatowns or that kind of thing? Well, I'll t I'll tell you a funny story. When I took the chiefs to uh, to Washington, uh, we met with uh, the Development Finance Corporation head. His name is David Bohegian. He's no longer head of the DFC, of course. That was under uh, President Trump. But he told me a funny story about uh, flying into APEC 2018 for the big summit in Port Moresby that was put on. And, of course, Xi Jinping was going to be the first non-Western speaker of, a, of an APEC summit. So the Chinese did everything they could to get things ready, including basically revamping a lot of downtown Port Moresby. So Bohegian was sitting next to 
Vice President Michael Pence. They were flying in on uh, the, the pre U.S. you know presidential plane, and Mr. Pence, who I guess is not exactly a world traveler, looked down and saw the, the beautifully newly landscaped Ella Beach and this. $50 million conference center that the Chinese had, had erected themselves so that Mr. Xi Jinping could give his speech. And Pence turned to Bohegian and said, hey, you know, I thought you told me Port Moresby was kind of like slum-like. This place, this place looks beautiful. Bohegian had to say, yeah, Mr. Vice President, that was all paid for by the Chinese. Okay, so China has made substantial investments in PNG. And again, the PNG politicians, unfortunately for the PNG people, are hopelessly corrupt. And so the biggest concern that our government and Australia has about PNG is can we hold on to controlling the PNG uh, government in, in the face of this massive uh, corruption pursuit by by China. They, they, they have done a lot in PNG. They've been thwarted somewhat by Australia in particular, but it's a major concern. To, to, to wrap up, you know, you, you have uh, recently published the book, They Call Me Ishmael. It's a novel, but it's also largely based on a true story. So tell us a bit about the book. Right. Well, it, it is, as you mentioned, Matt, it's, it's a, what they call a Roman a clef. It, it, it's, it's basically pretty much everything in the book really happened. So it's based on, on true events. It's the story of not only Ishmael, uh, because uh, he's, he's a, a deserving of a story, but it's also the story of Bougainville. Um, it starts with Ishmael as a 20-year-old man joining the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. And uh, it goes through the, the crisis and ends on the day before uh, the election in 2020 when uh, we were going to find out whether we had a president backed by an American investor, namely yours truly, or a president backed by China. So that, that's, that's what the book is all about. It, it is, like I say, um, uh, uh, basically on, based on true events. And it's, it's essentially still happening as we speak. Yeah, and, and in the book, you do talk a lot about what you call China creep. Yes. I mean, China was and is a big threat to Bougainville. And again, the only thing that staves them off right now is Ishmael himself and Ishmael's reaching out to governments like ours and Australia to try and get some help. But uh, as was asked earlier, is China going away? No, they're not going away. They want that copper and gold uh, and they want those strategic ports and it's going to be an ongoing battle. So we're on the front lines and this is going to be happening all over these island changes, as you folks know. Yeah, it seems like they, they're they really pretty rapidly moving forward with their plan to take over this part of the Pacific. Yeah, and they don't, they don't need all 10 of these countries to sign on to their development vision. They just need really one or two of them. And they've already kind of got Solomon Islands in the bag, right? And then, you know, they've got a... Just, just one Sounds or two like of them they built. PNG is not going to be too far behind. Yeah. yeah. And that's, of course, a big concern to Australia because of its geography. Although I would say probably any of the the nations would be of concern, right? I mean, there's Samoa, which is right next to an American territory, American Samoa. And they've got, you know, going all the way up into Melanesia and, and Mic Micronesia, Polynesia, all across that whole area, right? I mean, this is a lot of, uh, theoretically, a lot of countries should be concerned, but there's not uh, not as much concern, or not as much action on that concern as you would think there ought to be. Well, I think, look, to be fair to these countries, they're poor. Uh, they, they need money and they, they need friends. And also just to be accurate, while the United States was a 
omnipresent nation in the immediate aftermath of World War II, they basically forgot about the South Pacific and went back to Washington and, you know, focused on other things. And so these countries are susceptible. Furthermore, when you get elected in many of these countries, I would put Papua New Guinea right at the top of the list. I mean, basically, you're you're thinking yourself, but from the day you get elected, okay, how am I going to make some money out of this? And the Chinese are willing to take advantage of that mindset and the fact that your government controls resources. So PNG is right across the water from Bougainville, and Bougainville is still a political entity of PNG. But unlike in Bougainville, where the landowners control the resources, in PNG, the resources are controlled by the government. So that means that's like a big red sign going off for China. Hey, let's just get to these guys and just pay them off and get control of these mining resources. Yeah. And I think once you start, once you take over PNG or the Solomons or, you know, they, they have a foothold and then it's much easier for them to go after other more hesitant or harder to get countries. Right. I think, you know, once you once they actually build that naval base, and they might not call it a naval base, they'll call it a, you know, a deep water port for which they'll sign a 99-year lease like they did with, with Sri Lanka, uh, but it'll be a, a sort of way to project power. So then all those countries are even weaker in the face of that. Yeah, look, I, I think the biggest enemy uh, that, that, you know, civilization has in, in the South Pacific is the mindset that Europe had right before Mr. Putin decided to go into the Ukraine, which is, hey, everything's fine. Uh, We're really enjoying ourselves. I mean, gosh, look at this prosperity. Everything's just wonderful here until it's not. And I would say the biggest culprit in in committing that mindset right now is Australia. I I think Australia would just love to think that things are just going to continue like they have been. Well, they're not. China's on the march and you've got to pay attention to that drumbeat. So Australia just elected a new prime minister, Anthony Albanese. Do you think that Albanese understands the dangers of, of not taking action? What, I, what I've been told, obviously, we have to, down in Bougainville, pay a lot of attention to what's going on in Australia. What, what I understand is that Mr. Albanese and Mr. Morrison basically kind of think alike about China. The good news is I think uh, Australia has gone through a wake-up call with respect to China. I mean, look, China, as you guys know, they're down there actually bribing Australian politicians. I mean, everybody knows that. And and they, they've got, I would say, they're they're much more infiltrated in Australia than they are, let's say, in the United States. So I think the... Uh, The new prime minister is aware of that, but uh, I've been to Canberra and I can tell you that the people in, for example, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, again, they've got this, hey, let's not rock the boat strategy. You know, okay, Solomon Islands, that's our backyard. Hey, what's going on over there? I mean, how, how could those people do that? Well, come on. I mean, China's been... You know, I don't know if you guys have ever been to Honiara, which is the capital of the Solomon Islands. There's only one way to get there. You have to fly from Port Moresby. You get on a plane and there's 100 people, 85 85 of them are going to be Chinese. Okay. I mean, Solomon Islands is gone. Okay. So it's just, it's just what's going to happen to the rest of the places over there. And Australia, I think, is finally waking up and hopefully it's not too late. Well, I hope not. And I hope the U.S. also kind of wakes up and, and you know, it's a, l- a little late for the U.S. to try to restart its embassy, but, you know, could have done that 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, uh, there's, mean, a, there's an attempt. At least they're doing it now, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, anyway, John, uh, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we appreciate your, your insight into this. And, uh, you know, I hope that everything in Bougainville goes well for the people there. So do I. Thank you both uh, for uh, your time. and uh, uh, Stay in touch. Thank you. You know, that was pretty fascinating. I kind of want to go to Bougainville now. I do. Yeah. You know, I, 
ever since the last podcast we did with Cleo Pascal, I've been thinking like, I really want to go on like a Pacific Islands tour to see all the Chinese investment in these places. And I hadn't really thought about Bougainville uh, until now. And it's like, like, this is a really important place, not only because of its location, but also because it is an example of how you can stand up to the Chinese Communist Party. Yeah, it's like uh, in the Solomon Islands, there's, I'm going like to Mal Malaita province. Malaita province. Thank you, because I just forgot the name as I was talking. And, and we had Celsus Tefulu on uh, a recent podcast who's uh, an advisor to the premier of that province, Malaita province, in the Solomon Islands, which is like the one province out of the whole country that is also resisting Chinese Communist Party investment. And like that province is really struggling to to like deal with the politics of like they don't want Chinese investment, but the rest of the country does be because the corrupt leader of the country really does. And that's kind of like a Bougainville situation, right? Where Papua New Guinea wants the Chinese investment and Bougainville's like, no, we really but, we don't. But have Bougainville idea. has more autonomy at least, right? Yeah, no, and, they do have a lot more. And I hadn't thought about the whole idea of landowners controlling the natural resources on their land being so important because I think it's something we take for granted here. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I also like that's such an like if one thing sticks out to me uh from this podcast, it's that like the value of of like giving that power to people, which is which is like the opposite of the of communism, right? Like the Chinese Communist Party's whole mentality when they took over in 1949. It's like like all of this, they say it belongs to the people, but in practice, it's exactly the opposite because the only way that they can promise land to the people is by stealing it from the people who own it and taking it for the government with the promise that eventually it will go to the people, which it you never still can't, does. You can't own land in China. No, you're basically you, you, leasing it. You can buy an apartment or you can buy, but like you cannot- so like You don't own the land You that cannot own loan the land, yeah. So like, and, and this is the case- I mean, this is also the case in communist countries in general, right? Where you, you, uh, they they rise to power by taking the things that people have. They say they're taking from the rich, but they take from everybody, uh, and then they redistribute it. They redistribute it, you know, equally to, them, to, to themselves. <laughs> well, it's interesting because when my parents were growing up in China, um, and even when I was born in China, you could not, you could not even buy an apartment. Right, literally. Right. You have to get it from your work unit, right? Yes, so everybody worked for the state. And then your work unit, which is a, something we don't really have in the US, but it would be like your state-owned company that you work for that you know you have to get everything from, right? Like your healthcare comes from the state-owned company. You know, for women, the state-owned company tracks your menstrual cycles to make sure you're not having more than one baby, et cetera. Like, they also give you a place to live. And then there's a lot of um, corruption and competition to try to get a better apartment, right? Like, you know, you're like, I ha I need an apartment with two bedrooms because I've got five people, you know, I'm my parents are living with me or whatever. And then it's just... Well, so you're saying it's not distributed to each according to need? Uh, there's a lot of corruption. I know you're surprised, China and corruption, but yeah. Who would have guessed that a communist country would be corrupt? Uh, I mean, I think that's that's an interesting thing also when it comes to the Pacific Islands, right? That the Chinese Communist Party is not really able to change their model. Like they know how to deal with corrupt officials. Right. But when it comes to a place like Bougainville, instead of trying to figure out a way to... Um, you know, fundamentally change their strategy to go with, okay, the, here's a place where we have to deal with landowners and they're not interested in being corrupted. Like the government's not interested in being corrupted. How can we work here? They don't have that capacity. Right, because if you actually want to work with landowners, you have to actually legitimately help the landowners with the things that they need. And that's just not that's like, not what the system is set up for. Right, exactly. I think this is really, uh, it's been a very interesting insight into how the party operates and how an, an effective political system can resist that you know temptation, that promise of Chinese money 
uh, which is ultimately, you know, will will bleed them dry. I mean, I think it's also uh, just, uh, you know, it's like a little bit of hope that they're not going to just completely take over the entire Pacific. Yes. You know. And that is what we need now, hope. Hmm. So thanks for joining us. Uh, once again, I'm Matt Ganejda. I'm Shelley Zhang. Thanks for watching China Unscripted. And Chris will be back next time. He will.